It is time once again for an inside look. Let's go to the park! Yep, it's time to head down to the world of sea to see behind the scenes and into the lives of the animals that live here with the people that care for them. Now, the last two times we've come here for an inside look, we've gotten to see what goes on at Animal Playtime, as well as a little peek at animal babies and their mothers. But today, we're going to get to see a bit of what the veterinarians do here and how they care for sick and injured animals and keep the healthy ones healthy and happy. And I've heard that all the animals here have really good health care plans. The doctors make house calls, are on call, and there's no copay. Hmm? And just like before, we've got an explorer's guide with seven spots for stamps, which we can turn in at the end of the day for a special prize. Let's go! doctors were able to do dolphin dialysis, the first ever dolphin, um, and then we actually transported her to a local San Diego hospital to have those kidney stones lasered. Ten years later, you guys check out Dottie. She's in excellent health because of the work that our veterinarians did with our San Diego doctors working together. You saw Brittany kind of spray that blue spray on that toothbrush. It's called chlorhexidine. Uh, some of you may have had it at your dental appointments, kind of sprayed into your mouth. It does not taste good. But don't worry, you guys, Kometa does not have any taste buds. Dolphins have no taste buds, so she can't actually taste that. We just kind of use it as like a little toothpaste for her to make sure that her mouth is nice and clean and minty, kind of minty fresh, I suppose. So we do this twice a day to make sure that Kometa's mouth uh, is staying nice and clean. Dolphins, um, you guys, dolphins only have one set of teeth their entire lifetime. They don't have a set of baby teeth that fall out and then their adult teeth grow in, just one set of teeth. So it is very important that our dental care for our dolphins uh, is also checked out. And we do mouth exams on them every single day. Now they've really got some smart and skilled people working with the dolphins here. Who knew dolphins brush their teeth? And just remember, if you should happen to see dolphins leaving the planet Earth on their own, you might want to try and hitch a ride on the first Vogon constructor ship that just happens to be near the planet. Just random advice. Moving on. 
Now it's time to go see the dolphins' relatives, the orcas, and learn about how SeaWorld vets do body exams, conduct ultrasounds, and other procedures to assess the animal's overall health. Can you imagine the size of the tongue depressors that they have to use? And for this presentation, we have an up-close vantage point that was opened up for a limited number of pass holders. Okay, so it sounds like there's really a lot to taking care of the orcas here, but the vets and the trainers really know what they're doing. And there's no giant tongue depressors. I mean, that's just silly, right? And now it's time to head to the SeaWorld Rescue Center and the Animal Hospital to meet some of the rescue team and the biologists from the SeaWorld Research Institute. And while we're there, we're gonna get a look at some Humboldt penguins. They live in warm weather, so I bet they love San Diego. I'm a senior research biologist at Hubs SeaWorld Research Institute. We're a not-for-profit organization that has been collaborating with SeaWorld since the year before the park opened. Our job is to take advantage of having access to the animals at SeaWorld to try to help the ones out in the wild. So what if we can find a way to make sure that they don't have to strand in the first place? That's kind of the idea. This thing here is a pinger. It's something that we put on nets or lines. It makes a little peep, and the idea is that this warns an animal that there's something there so that they can avoid it. So we actually put the pinger in with six different species of seals, sea lions, and dolphins. This is what the sea lions did and the seals. 
I'll pass this around. They jumped out of the water when they heard the pinger turn on. Little Commerson's dolphins, which are like the harbor porpoises we have here, when this black line goes up, that means that the porpoise was spending more and more time in a refuge pool where he didn't have to listen to the pinger. So both of those kinds of behaviors tell us that these animals probably find this little ping kind of obnoxious and that that's why it's working. We also found that it didn't deter them from getting near nets. And now I get to compete with a thunderbolt. In fact, we had situations where the animals got surprised by the little ping and actually ran into a net. So clearly this is something that's going to work best in open water where they hear it at a distance and then they just get away, but probably not very well if the animal has to get near the net. Does anybody know what this animal here is? Manatee, that's right. And you guys see what the manatee is doing with the pinger? He's got the pinger pressed up against his manatee ear. The manatee swam up to it and put it up against his head. Now is that exactly what I had in mind? Probably not. Because the goal of using the pinger was to try to keep the manatee from getting wrapped up in this thing here, which is floppy polypropylene line. So we went back to the agency and said, no, I'm sorry, but that pinger is not going to be your answer. But we suggested this stuff. So we tried that with the manatees and found out that when the float line was on that stuff, that it reduced the number of times the animal got wrapped up by about 10 times. It was pretty effective. So thanks very much for your attention. For the uh, collection of animals, the animals that we have in the park, we know their medical history. We practice preventative medicine, and depending on the animals, every two months, every year, we're gonna get a, a blood work. We might do ultrasounds. Before the park opens, uh, 10 or 11 a.m., we're here at 7, and all of the veterinarians are doing rounds through all the park um, areas with animals. And that's daily. Daily we collect samples from each pool in the, in the park. We're very special in that the water for the pools comes from the bay. They go through a very well filtration system. The other thing that we have on site that is very important is um, we have our own pharmacy. That means that when we have a patient, we don't have to put in a prescription, wait for it to be refilled, and figure out which one of us is going to run to the pharmacy. We have the pharmacy on site. The other thing that we have is our own laboratory. I tend to tell people that this place is small, but it's mighty. Just like I had experience on human virology first, all of our medical technologies have experience in human hospital first, some of them for over a decade before they come join exotic animal medicine. So from the rescue center, we don't know too much about the animals. So this morning, if you notice, the floor is still wet, and that's because we had a sea lion here that was rescued from La Jolla. Um, it had a sharp bite on the side. We know that for the safety of the animal and the safety of the staff, we go ahead and put the animal under anesthesia. So while it's under, we're cleaning the wound, but someone is also checking the ears, the vision, the teeth. We're getting fecal samples, we're drawing blood samples, those go to the lab immediately. We're able to move these easily accessible for short people. <laughs> um, X-ray machine around the room and we're able to tell full X-rays of the body of the animal. Wait a second. Now since then, we still do, they still do guano harvest, 
but the local people in collaboration with scientists and also the local government, they do it in designated areas at times of the year where the birds are not there or there's little to no impact on them. That small change in behavior has allowed the populations to come back up and they have been recently well, taken off the endangered species list. You might see these guys back on the list again if we don't change our way as far as what we're doing globally. They are back here because they have little traffic coming in. The only people that get to see these guys is either specialized towards like the one that you're on or if you actually personally request it and pay for a VIP for it. But this uh, exhibit that you see before you is really well designed for them and we provide fish to them two different ways, one of which you're going to see Vicky do right now. And that's what we call a broadcast feed. These guys are naturally fishermen. So if you throw get the fish in the water, you're going to see them naturally forage. We also will sit and hand feed our birds. And their base diet consists of Karen and Caitlin. And they're fed that two times a day. And then they have a nice, large dirt land area. Now that being, these guys are a warm species of penguin. When they come on land and nest, they're coming on land and nest either on the ancient guano areas or on garden sand. So they are actually, in fact, burrowing nesters. They will dig one to two feet in the ground, lie their nest with vegetation, and lay their eggs that way. And you can see some divots in the ground, which are basically, that's what their burrows are. And that's the Humboldt's. So that one is, which one of these kids is not like the other? That in fact is a salvage bird that came in, a local cormorant that was injured, had a broken wing, had to do a half amputation on it, so unfortunately was made unreleasable, but was given a second chance of life. All right, you guys, thank you so much for coming to Humboldt today. Enjoy the rest of your day. You know, SeaWorld has rescued more than 35,000 animals since the park opened in 1964. I'm really glad these people are here doing what they do. Because if they weren't here in the park, or out there helping sick and injured animals, who would be? Would you? That's 35,000 grateful animals. Now, in addition to all the animals that live under the sea that are in SeaWorld's care, they also take care of animals that live above the sea. Animals of the avian variety. I'm talking about birds. So let's go meet some of the bird rescue team and see what they do to help take care of seabirds. marine mammals, seabirds, things like that, that maybe we don't have the resources or facilities to take care of them, we'll send them down here and you guys will get to see kind of the pools and the different facilities SeaWorld has to actually give these animals their best chance to get back out in the wild. Um, we have some different display items up here. So for example, these display cages have lots of different fishing equipment. And these are all things that had to be taken out of animals at our care center. So you guys can see there's hooks, there's fishing lines, baits, anything like that. So it's just sort of a PSA to be really, really careful, especially disposing with fishing lines and fishing equipment in general. All of these animals, a lot of them you guys might see on our table, people really don't like them. People really, really, really don't like them. So part of Project Wildlife's ultimate goal is just educating people on these guys. So like for example, the opossum, everybody thinks it's some like terrifying giant rat that's just walking around their backyard messing things up. But these guys are super helpful to have around. You can eat 5,000 ticks in one season. They can eat rattlesnakes, they're eating rats, mice, all sorts of stuff. Same with skunks. These guys are eating black widows, scorpions, all sorts of stuff that you don't want in your yard at all. So these guys are really helpful, so we always just want to educate people more about these animals. And if you ever find one that needs help, bring them on into us, and we will do our best to rehab them and release them back out. They might be ready for you at the next station. Uh, my name is Hunter. I am uh, one of the team members here at the Bird Rescue and Rehab Center. 
here at SeaWorld. This is our Oiled Wildlife Center. So anytime, if and when there ever was an oil spill, we are ready to respond to that oil spill to start intaking animals. Uh, we are the southernmost facility here in St. Uh, State. Um, there are multiple facilities along this network up and down the coast. We are prepped and kitted to uh, respond to an oil spill within 12 to 24 hours to start taking in animals the next day. Throughout the year, we are bird rescue building uh, only. However, if there was an oil spill, all of the birds that we currently have will be moved out uh, to the other side of the park for housing. And then this becomes an oiled animal building only. That also includes uh, seals and sea lions. Any bird uh, or animal that comes, we'll clean them off. So we'll give them a warm, uh, warm water dawn bath to help break down those oils on them. And then we can monitor them here for any uh, toxic effects that the oil might have on them, administer any medications, and then eventually return them back out to the wild. Most of the time when they do come in, they're you know lethargic, not feeling very well. Uh, so we'll keep them inside for most of their rehab in the beginning. Once they start feeling better, we'll put them out here. So this can house uh, seals and sea lions. Uh, it has housed sea turtles as well as dolphins. We also have several aviaries on the back of this building, uh, which has bushes, plants, uh, perching, and branches so that uh, once the birds are starting to feel better, uh, we can introduce them outside. Uh, now, whenever we do have a bird come in, uh, we begin the rehabilitation process immediately. So our first concern is going to be hydration. So we'll do that in two ways. Uh, the first is we're going to tube feed them. Uh, and we'll administer a hydration fluid that's very similar to Gatorade. Uh, the second, if anyone's ever been to a hospital, seen a hospital show, you've seen these bags, um, we rehydrate the animals in a similar manner. Now once we've got them stabilized, then we can start addressing what's really going on. Um, are there external injuries that we need to address? We will, uh, metal, detect, metal detecting wand, we'll go right over their body. Uh, sometimes they have swallowed fishing hooks. Uh, now in the event of an oil spill, uh, and if we are asked to respond, all those oil animals would come to this facility. Uh, now in the event of an oil spill, it does generally become a legal issue, and we tend to be on the front lines as far as evidence collection. Uh, we will remove five oiled feathers from a bird uh, and then we'll put those feathers into a um, aluminum foil. That foil goes into a plastic bag. That bag goes into an envelope. That envelope is covered uh, in evidence tape. So rescuing birds and taking care of birds is not something that's for the birds. It's actually very important. And the rescue teams really know what they're doing. They're not just winging it. Yeah, there's no bird brains in there. All right, I'll stop with the bird puns. They never fly with people anyways. Okay, now let's head over to Wild Arctic to see how SeaWorld takes care of beluga whales. Of their tail, so you can visually see the veins, and we're able to get a blood stick. 
Beluga whales are from the Arctic. They live in very, very harsh conditions. This is pretty nice for up here, sunny San Diego, 55 degrees. The ocean temperatures they live in are below freezing, about 28 degrees. So uh, the same animal up in the Arctic might have several hundred more pounds of fat on them just to be able to withstand that colder temperature there. The forehead, called the melon, is an oil-filled sac. So what's happening in the dark, murky ocean of the Arctic? It's not clear like this. Their eyesight doesn't do much for them. So what they do is they can produce a sound, and that oil-filled sac will take that sound and focus it into a beam and send it out into the environment. The sound echoes off objects. They get the vibration of the sound through their lower jaw into their brain. So think about a submarine with sonar, where it can actually give you a, a mental image of what's in front of you. And it's pretty amazing for the uh, climate they live in, where it's dark six months out of the year, and it's very murky water. We do a lot of training every day. We thought this afternoon we would just have fun and just show a play session. We have all the different types of toys and enrichment items back here. And you can see how interactive they are. We have, we've been stepped down for a half hour here. We haven't pulled out one fish. This kind of shows you the kind of bond and relationship that we build with these animals so they just have fun with us. It's not just because we have a food bucket in front of us. You know, beluga whales always look so happy. Such a beautiful smile on a very majestic animal. And who knew there was so much to maintaining the salt and freshwater like that? That's a lot of water. I'm a big fan of the freshwater myself. Very hydrating compared to the salt water. All right, my friends, we are nearing the end of our journey for the day. We've collected all seven stamps on our explorer's guide. So it's time to turn them in and collect our reward. Very informative game. Who says that learning can't be fun? No, really, I don't know. Do you? I don't know. Anybody who says that sounds kind of boring. Thank you so much for joining me here at SeaWorld San Diego today for an inside look at how the vets and rescue teams take care of sick and injured and healthy animals. Till next time, see you later. Hey. Remember how I said there were top men working on the Bayside Skyride? Well, there they are. Top men getting ready to work atop the Bayside Skyride. Or as you and I know it, the gondola of love. And from what I hear, it's supposed to be reopening real soon. I know of a certain Von Roll family member who will be really happy about that. You know, the family that built the ride. Remember how I told you SeaWorld was getting a new roller coaster in 2020? Well, construction has begun. Permits have been secured and construction is underway for the Mako Dive Coaster set to open sometime next year. Now when Mako opens, it's gonna be the tallest dive coaster in California. Sorry, hang time. You won't be the tallest anymore, but you'll still be the first. They can never take that away from you ever. So stay tuned and I'll try to keep you updated on the Mako Dive Coaster construction. Just look at how big that footprint is. It's going to be huge.
quiet. <laughs> 